I'm Paul Roberts, and today I'm going to do something that I've never done, but everybody should do, including me, and that is go over this list of the five things I do not know for my life purpose, even with faith and with the living word. As if I were going to die tomorrow and I had nothing more to say, everything I could possibly say that I can't get past in my life is contained on this one page that I'm going to elaborate on with you today and I hope that it will help people to find their way in life and realize what's important and realize how little they can actually know and when they bump up against the wall at the end of life they're left with just a few things hopefully I'm left with five I'll go over them my name is Paul Roberts I was born in 1965 in Detroit, Michigan. All I am is narrowed down to just these things. All else can be shown by the light of the living word through Jesus' teachings. I've gotten past practically everything I can fathom in life. Nothing holds me back. I am what I am for lacking the total understanding and ability to get past these five things. There are many things that people actually are simply uninformed of or do not know knowledge-wise. That's not of concern. All those things do not need to be known and may never be known by anybody. So that's not what we're talking about here. My best answers on these five things is where I'll be judged because my lack of ability to find the answers of these things lies in darkness most of my adult life I have consciously sought heightened conscious as my main life purpose. This pursuit has been the only real thing that I'm most certain of. It thus far has yielded one very strong but difficult to accept answer that I do not know and thus no one knows. When I say that, I mean everything I think and feel and experience and see, I do not know what any of the answers are. Even the answers that I try to help people with in my conscious counseling, problem solving, perspective counseling offerings that I make. I don't know what the answers are. By not knowing, I've come to a heightened conscious perspective that actually can help many people, including myself to gain a heightened ability in life to understand and be a valued asset as a life purpose person. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. The act of attempting to know or delude ourselves that we can know is responsible for almost all life's atrocities throughout the history of mankind. And the closest thing I can find to trying to put an answer to that and help with that and provide solutions is Jesus' teachings. They don't show anything negative that would take away from that. It's mankind and they're not understanding of them or they're not desiring to understand them, wallowing in darkness, causing the atrocities and many attribute it to that or other religions. Those people that attribute things to those things are ignorant. They don't understand what I've come to see. My eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. This was a silk screen given to me for my high school graduation by my art teacher. He was a simple man, but in that simplicity he was complex and had all that he needed. I'd like to be able to do that with my life purpose. I don't believe I can rise by monetary means or power means or any type of egotistical means to a higher level than I've been able to ascend consciously by myself and through my marriage and through following Jesus' teachings and understanding the living word. And I'd like to share what my eyes have seen and what it means and how you can find similar things that are powerful and aiding in your life. I cannot find 
more than I already have by myself. But I hope too, if I continue to live with communion of my wife in Jesus' church, in our joint life purpose together. And Jesus' church, according to his word, is whenever there are two or more gathered in his name, and he is with them. If there's love there, an understanding of his teachings, he can guide. Two or more. Communion with another person, with the opposite sex, creates the entire created picture in front of Jesus, in front of God, of what the creation was. And the reason for that purpose is that those two combined souls, combined mentalities, become one, but they have unique things to offer that the one entity couldn't have come to by themselves. And furthermore, if there were two of the same sexual entity, they couldn't have come to the full understanding of the creation and what its union with two people together could have achieved. That doesn't mean that you can't be with another person and find a lot of things and enjoy your life, as many have. It just means there will be a few factors missing. You'll have to acknowledge that. I'm not going to judge you for it. That's not my purpose here today. I'm saying that I've chosen to take the road where the entire collective purpose of mankind comes together in union, standing on the rock of the living word with love for one another and for Jesus' teachings that give the cornerstone guidance of the entire word that's been given to man through the Bible. And I believe that contains everything that man as a creation needs to know but unfortunately, as I'm saying this today to you, it can't be known. It can only be found on faith. I call it the light. I call it the light of consciousness, heightened consciousness through understanding the light that came into the world, the light of creation, the Big Bang, the whole thing. <laughs> the whole big kahuna. The enchilada. That's what I want to talk about today. So let's talk about the things that I'm challenged with. And you will come to know me. Just as Jesus says, if you follow my commands and study the teachings, you will come to know him. Now that's a word no that I grappled with earlier in my life. Where I thought I could know. But I realized through faith, I could only know through faith. The knowing part is knowing what to have faith in. That's what the knowing part is. But even when I get there and I understand him through and through, and I understand why he's the cornerstone and why the chosen people before were what they were and what they did and how God set it up for them and how they failed with that covenant, and I understand the new covenant that Jesus created with that church that I spoke of a moment ago and how the people that came after him got things wrong that were mirrored in the first part and I understand all those things. I understand those things. I've come to know him. He's shown me as the cornerstone all these things. But I have to have faith that it's all real and true. Because it doesn't appear in front of me. Okay? That's where I'm at as I progress with the five things I don't know. Number one. Does God exist? And is he the God of the Bible? Bonus included with this. Is Jesus his only son, or just as we are all his sons? Was some of that symbolic, what Jesus talked about? Well, we know that John 3.16 says his only begotten son. It, it tends to, to suggest that he's really the only one. He could be talking about his only begotten human creation. We won't go to all the, uh, the analyzing that you could do with every word of the Bible because when you try to analyze every single word of the Bible, it can lead you down many paths to many different places. Even though it is living, for the purposes of this video, I am trying to not go and get lost. I'm trying to stay focused. That's one of the things I don't know. Number two, with the work that was done by Jesus, what changed 
for the Gentile, the non-chosen person. And what did not change for the Gentile? According to, no stroke will be taken from or added to the law. We obviously don't have the holiest of holies. We obviously can't take sacrifices and take our best animals and give them to the priests. That covenant was broken. The temple curtain was torn when Jesus was crucified on the cross and the loud thunderclap. But all that was part of the law. How can not a stroke be taken away or added to if all those types of things were part of the law? I can't fully understand that as a Gentile, being outside and grafted on to God's acceptance of me through Jesus. Maybe I never will. Number three, we are to give to all who ask. Is what we already give with our life's work and purpose, as I try to share in all the things I do and am, and to all that will listen, and even with my taxation, ability to give out and even vote for things that will help those people, even at my own loss of having less, is that giving or are we to take out and give? I know that after Jesus was gone, a man asked the disciples and they said, I have not gold to offer you, but receive now the gift of the Holy Spirit. They emulated a gift or a giving that was worthy of giving, but without having to have it be coined. Now, I believe they went down a course that was shown in the Old Testament of what is common to the nature of man. And so I only want to take so much from anybody after the Gospels. But everything, every word of God, every word that's been written down, and ordained into the Bible, you have to say, you can't be responsible to God for it if it was a trick of evil. Jesus is the cornerstone to help you understanding past the tricks of evil. So I look at these things and that suggests to me that we are to give to all who ask, but I'm surrounded where I live by a place that is one of the six largest economies in the world, I'm surrounded by excess and people that have many, many means, far more than they could ever want. I'm surrounded by greed and I'm surrounded by suffering and oppression and poverty and vices and choices people have made to go both of those two directions. So there are always people asking. What I try to do is have my life purpose provide something into this world, inject it into this world so that I'm giving to get past that. But I don't know if that means I'm supposed to monetarily and all other ways go and chase after that person, and be there for them to the ends of the earth and give up my family and my means or surely I'll join them if I don't keep staying solvent. So that's one of the things I don't know. Number four, the Jews were to highly desire one another sexually and receive much longing and joy for the sexual experience itself. I believe personally that this was to ensure the procreation that was promised to Abraham and bring forth the joy and health and happiness that is promised by Moses, by God, for the people, if they have faith and are righteous and do as God had asked in the covenant. Bonus included with this, are we to highly desire sexually our chosen one or ones, though prolific procreation isn't promised to us in our genealogy? And bonus two, what if we sign on for life? Are we to expect the other will maintain that desire for us and us for them? 
And when we look at another individual that we find attractive because we're artists and we understand visual acuity, and even if we're not artists, we have things that we find interesting to us that are not of us, but we say, oh, that's interesting. I like that. My eyes have been able to see something that I lift up higher as a beauty rather than an ugliness. At what point does that become something that dominates our life to where we go to the old covenant solution, pluck out your eye if it causes you to sin. Your hearts were made hardened and you will be able to divorce because you couldn't see what I was trying to do for you. At what point do we, in our Gentile, non-chosen people, life after Jesus, have the freedom to believe that what we see is what we should desire in our earthly form? And how do we relate to others that feel that way or differently? How do we construe to a person that if they see somebody, I, I, in the entertainment industry and just with the people I've been, I have had, and I've been a, an, an introvert, a uh, strong heterosexual all my life, but have had many relationships, probably more relationships that were stronger, because I took the time for a person, with gay people that preferred this, Either they were, I'm not even going to say the word, shouldn't even say the word gay. They, they didn't know where their directions or their attention should be placed. They were a little lost about that, and they assumed a role and took it to where they went in life. I've had more relationships where I've spent more time talking with them than I have with just about anybody else other than my main friend that I have, who's an atheist. And I have a limited relationship with him because I, he can't help me with any of these things either that I'm talking about today. So, on that topic, are we supposed to believe our desires if we're pure in heart and seeking the Lord and coming to know Jesus? Are we supposed to believe that God ordained this for even those outside of the Jewish faith? And how does that work? Because they were not even allowed to cast their seed on the ground because that would mean that they didn't believe that God had a greater purpose for them if they went beyond, and whatever it was in God's hands happened, happened. Today we get into all this legislation about what we're supposed to tell a person they should have to do legally, because we have no faith in God. So we make laws that cover all our bases, supposedly. These things have driven divisions into my own family, where I've come to see these things that I'm talking about here and they come to find a difference with me in as closely articulated as a way that I can find that Jesus was talking about because of me father will be against son and brother against brother and so forth and so on so that one's a big one number four can I trust my own belief of what beauty is and desire for it as an artist and aesthetics to be of goodness even if I'm married and I commit to one person but I still see beauty other in places I'm not going to run after it but I can't block it out like a horse with blinders on it's part of our eyesight should I take away my eyesight that proceeds to help my family and has kept me alive all these years and helps me to give my life purpose as they used to say in the olden days should we give that up so that our whole self does not get thrown into the fire so that's number four and that's one of the biggest ones and one of the ones that you know even if I found the answer to it. I wouldn't know that I found the answer to it. I would just say, okay, I'm comfortable with this. A lot of people are, right? And number five. This is number five, not number one. But for so many from where I came, it was number one. Is hell a physical place where we are tormented forever if we do not find the way to salvation? which, according to Jesus, few do, 
because the straight narrow road is difficult to find and only a few will find it. Or is hell just a way to describe what would be lost if the obtaining of eternal life was indeed possible? But that life is not gained but lost instead. Is that what hell is? The weeds coming up around us that are not of Jesus' ways, the Master's ways, are said to allow to grow around the plants that will be harvested until the last day, and only then when the harvest is secure, be bundled and thrown into the fire. This could be simply a metaphor, a story that the farmers and the people of the time would understand. It could also mean that there's a fire, an unquenchable fire that will will succumb to if we don't pass all these tests of the understanding of what the Word can show us in time for Judgment Day. If I live another day, I'll continue on like I am. I will do what I can to educate, support, and guide, and nourish my family and myself I will do everything I can to make my purpose more aware to myself and my family so that we can exercise that as we do the things we do. But my purpose is guided by the highest commandment that Jesus gave at the Lord's Supper, that I am to do unto others in love as a brother in the way that I would have others in love as a brother through Jesus' teachings do unto me. So I don't want people coming from all angles to tell me what to do because I can't trust the nature of man that it's better off than what I know is inside that I've done with my study and my heightened conscious pursuit in life so therefore I don't go and bombard others like the church that I grew up in said we should let your light be on a candle stand for all to see, not under a basket. I wanted my life to be very much like this. My life partner said, no, let's just live good, decent lives, and we will, on that candle stand, show that. So the emergence of the submittal of a man and woman together created a combined Jesus teaching that we've lived with to this day. If that doesn't change, We'll go to our grave with all the things that we have done and could have done. Because I'm able as a human being to fathom the infinite, I am able to see what we could do with God's help. Because through God I believe all things are possible. I'm also able to see what we are failing to do. And I work hard at those things but I don't know how to do them better because I can't lead a horse to water and make it drink. I must have faith that all the things that are happening to me are meant to happen and they're a part of the whole picture. And even though I'd like to rush to the end of the finish line and make sure I'm there and make sure it's all right, I'm not able to do that any more than Jesus was. And so therefore, I have become as much like him as I know how to become without being born into an immaculate conception without original sin and without someone coming to allow me to die on the cross for all people. This is not the nature of what my life purpose probably is. However, with our government turmoil that we have now, maybe many will come to those ends. Maybe the hard, long end days will be as obvious as those that can see the sky is red and understand what that means has been for me all my life. I remember at the age of 12, 13, 14, we had a Bible study uh, at the time with my diving coach, Rick. And he took us into the library at the boys club. We sat down, he talked to us about the end days, what he believes, what the church believes, what the word shows, what they may look like. 
I've been able to filter everything that I've gone through through the knowledge of that at an early age and every time I see something happening it makes me realize that the enclosure around us in this physical realm has gotten to the point where it will cause us to have to make difficult life choices if we're ever confronted with those during our lifetime and the one entity that is so all-encompassing of us can be assigned to a system or a machine or a software program or one person even or several or many and our ability to live in this world due to greed and the design of the powerful people that have gotten what they have through greed and manipulation and power over others soon will have the ability as they're showing now that they already are trying to have to own everything the Indians once said when we came to this land how can anyone own the land now people are saying how can anybody own that software product that you've got to have in order to living how can anybody own that seed that's genetically altered how can anybody own a product that you need that you're not even allowed to work on without making sure that everybody else in your license agreement is allowed to have theirs so that they can fix that for you if an iron curtain comes down and slams and says you can't have those things if you don't succumb to what it is that we tell you that you need to do You'll lose out and you won't have the ability to be at the trade, at the trade places, the ability to live. These things are happening now. And with the power we currently have in the world, in very many places, we're seeing a person who more than ever sees strength in that, wants to have that power, and if we give it, to him and the other entities that want it, that world that I'm talking about will have more of a chance of existing, thriving, and culminating. With my last days with this, if this is my video of my death, that is my full life message here today. I've been supportive of my children. I've given so much to them that I've forgotten who Paul was. I left my family, I left and cleft. I now have children that are just about ready for college and starting their own life. I have more time to think about these things. I've been blessed with this ability to have this time to see my children grow up. Now, of course, I'd love to do that more. I'd love to see what they do, but it's not necessary. I'd love to see how those things work out, but that's not necessary. I'd love to see what their soul looks like, but that's not necessary. What's necessary is I've lived my life purpose that I've been given to the highest level that I know how to live it. That's what's important. If I'm going to be remembered for something, that's what I'd be, want to be remembered for. That's what I'd want to stand on. That's what I'd want to be my rock. And it came from Jesus. And what he helped me to see was the light. As I said, my eyes have seen the glory. That's how I came to see it. I give credit to that. Yes, I worry. As I have all the days of my life. That if I get something wrong. And I fail. Negative ramifications stand there. If I'll be judged, it'll be on these things I've said to you today. I don't know how to gain a higher answer for any of them. If you do, if I'm still alive, and you want to be my friend or a companion, or a life partner or a brother in Christ, your mission should be, in my opinion, to share these things that you have back with me, if you have something I don't, but to take all the things I'm sharing with you and use them in your life 
to come to at least this level that I'm at right now, where I've gone as far as I can and must continue to strive and try to seek help and reach out, but don't know that I can do it any more than the point I'm at. If you're not to a place like that in your life, and you might not even want to be, something's wrong. You should at least want to be there. It's like the Matrix. He knew something was wrong. This was enough to have the people that were looking at him realize he was worthy to be shown. He didn't like what he found out when he saw, but because he didn't want to have that world that he knew something was wrong in, he was worthy of rising to the challenge to overcome that which confronted him. That's not Jesus' story, but it's a story of a man in a fantasy realm that could actually be that way. I'm speaking to you as a man in a real realm that understands that position and could actually be that way. My whole life, I've been cloaked in the soup superhero mentality that we can rise to a higher level than what we are and do greater things than we thought we could if we choose to think as if we could. That's what I've tried to do with every fiber of my being to the best way I know how at any given time. So, today, on this day, I have nothing more to say, and this journey will travel on. I feel lonely much of the time. I find a very difficult time finding another person on the path with me that can share these things that I see and understand through Jesus' teachings. And to me, ironically, Without judgment, I say, why is it that others I speak to about Jesus' teachings judge and condemn me when they hear what I share that's so obviously right there? We could make that number six. <laughs> what I don't know, but I'm not putting it on the list because I don't need to know that because I don't judge them. I wonder about them, but I don't judge them. I pray for them, but I can't change them. I pray for them as much as I do for the person that hasn't seen yet. I pray for them because, in my opinion, they may not have seen. In my opinion, they may, may be nothing different than an atheist. Finding a comfort area that they can be in to get through this difficult life. I shared with you what I struggle with. They may struggle with those things or others or many more, but they find a comfort place to be shielded and they live their life like that. In my opinion, they're not confronting their problems. They're not rising to heightened consciousness. They're not finding and working for solutions every day. That's an assessment, not a judgment, because I can't know. I've shown you what I do and I repeatedly show it through videos, through anybody that talks to me, you can't get another me out of me. This is me and has been me and will be me. I'm Paul Roberts, Conscious Counseling 101.